and thank you for joining us for another exciting episode of Scuttlebutt, the official podcast of the National Museum of the Surface Navy, coming to you from the Associated Foundations Training Center aboard the Battleship Iowa and in conjunction with, or association with, the Surface Navy Association's Battleship Iowa chapter. I love coming through through uh, to starting these because there's a mouthful there. Joining me in the studio today are... Mike Getcher, I got this really long title, uh, but I'll start with just chief engineer, chief operating officer, chief cook and model washer type guy. <laughs> uh, I'm Marianne Fengler. I'm communications specialist and currently giggling a lot. And I probably should have introduced myself. I'm David Canfield, the chief, <laughs> uh, chief information officer and a Battleship Iowa veteran, vice president, and uh, the introducer here. And finally... Kyle Abbey. I am the Director of Development aboard the ship, working on the National Museum Project and all other fun things that we do here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go Kyle. But I, I did have a question. I was out on deck, and uh, turret three looked a little crooked to me. I hate it, it when that happens. It's crooked, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a little off. Exactly and so, 13 degrees to port. Right, right. And I've seen a few folks on board from the 80s crew and the, the operations team kind of coming out of the woodwork here to get up inside there and make some things happen. So, Mike... Can you give a little background on what Turret 3 was up to in the past couple of weeks? <laughs> well, it has a mind of its own. Yeah, it yeah. Does. All, all 2,000 <laughs> tons of it are nominally 1,700 tons. Um, th- this kind of goes back to a couple of things. We, we actually uh, received as a donation from the Navy, uh, now what, six, seven years ago, I think, uh, 150, and I'm going to be very careful with my language here, inert, non-explosive, very, very simple, innocent, rounds, projectiles, bullets. They're all 1,900 pound uh, projectiles. We're also getting another 21 armor piercing inert rounds from somebody else here pretty soon. So we have 170 some odd, uh, basically 170 tons of projectiles to load down into turret one. Um, now turret one is the, the turret that we have a long-term plan to open up uh, for, for tours down deep. Right now you can get up into the gun house, which is very cool. See the, the breaches of the guns. But you want to be able to, at some point, get down below to the fifth deck, you know, at the powder flat level and get up into the projectile flat. So, um, and also we want to get our projectiles off of the dock where they're just sitting there and gathering dust. So we have this plan to get it down into turret one. And there's a couple of ways of doing this, but, but really the, the big challenge is you go back to what the Navy really designed um, is that they had specific locations and rotational positions for these turrets in order to load the projectiles down mm-hmm. into them. And uh, literally in the book from OP769, which is the the Navy pub, um, turret one is rotated to 266 degrees. Think uh, at the head of the the bow is zero and it goes around to 266, so almost directly to port uh, to be able to uncover the strike down hatches for that turret. Turret two, um, to to line up, it's not just the turret exposure, uh, exposing rather the the strike down hatches, but also aligning the the shivs, as we call it in in the maritime world, or the pulleys for the cable winches that uh, actually will lower the projectiles down in. But uh, turret two actually goes even further to port and then even aft to 233 degrees. Um, And so each one of those turrets, we can't move for different reasons. Turret one, of course, all the way to port, you're literally blocking the bow of the vessel, you know, and, and the barrels hang off the side 20 feet. That may look cool, but you can't even get up to the bow hardly at all. So that, that doesn't really, really work for us. And then very importantly, turret two is, of course, a memorial. And there's some challenges inside with the mechanics, so we're not going to rotate that. So we started looking at uh, potentially rotating turret three to align, once again, that, that lifting system, the cables uh, and the strike down hatches with the shivs on the turret. Um, we had some other options, but, you know, we discarded them relatively quickly. Uh, up forward, we might have been able to use a crane that's very expensive. Um, we have limited room for the crane. We have to do uh, some engineering just to be able to allow a crane on the dock. Um, uh, even rolling projectiles up there, because you roll them on the, on the deck for a while before you actually get them in position, uh, is a real challenge up there because of the condition of the deck. So, you know, we started thinking a little bit more out of the box, and I think that's really who we are um, here is to, to really challenge, you know, some of the original um, or perhaps the, the more uh, conservative points of view on these things. And we started asking the question, can we rotate turret three? And, uh, you know, looking at it, we, we planned this for a number of months. We had uh, a number of meetings. You know, there's many hundreds of hours of thought and discussion and some safety protocols and some preparation that went into this. And then this, uh, two weeks ago now, I guess, almost two weeks. Almost uh, two weeks, yeah. Yeah, we had uh, um, a wonderful man come out from Texas, senior chief, gunner's mate, retired uh, Rich Cannon, 
um, you know, ten, eight years in the battleship program in the 1980s, we had appropriately named as well. There you go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you, <laughs> absolutely. And then uh, we had Chief uh, Marty Palmier, who was aboard the, the Iowa in the 80s for five and a half years. He left as the electrical supervisor. We had Chief Moser, um, HTC um, Moser, who helped with uh, everything. And then we had George Muslin, our electrician, who literally uh, his first job out of high school was to build FFGs over at Todd Shipyard. So we had this amazing group of people and we knew the machinery and we read the book, you know, and there you go. And uh, next thing you know, we're we're spending some money to do this, um, but uh, right. we managed to get it up and running. Right. Yeah. I think some of the I mean, from my perspective, I, I get a big power bill during the summer months and I go, whoa. But all of the power, am I, if I if I'm correct, was pulled from the shore and reallocated to just the turret to make this thing happen. Just about more or less. You know, we have 1,600 amps of available power uh, from the shore. Um, when the ship was uh, in active service back in the 80s, it actually had 4,000 amps, but that's way too much. Uh, with 1,600, we, we, we did what we call sh uh, load shedding a little bit just to make sure that we had as much as we could. And then there's something called a, a low voltage starter, in this case, an auto transformer type that allows you to soft start the, the motor. And so, yeah, we did, in fact, do it uh, offshore power. And that's an important point because, you know, there's a lot of rumors and myths out there in, in our little world of, of battleship uh, aficionados. And already there's a lot of rumors of, oh, you must have cranked up the uh, the boilers and, and things like that. And that's a... Nope. Hang on for the, the beep, beep, beep. Here we go. Almost done. You know, the Navy contract doesn't allow you to, to light off equipment for the purposes of navigation. You know, that's literally written in the contract. I mean, the, the Navy is not going to let us take this thing for a joyride. That's verbatim out of the contract, in fact. But um, in this case, though, we can activate some of this equipment to do other things, namely maintenance, safety, and display. Yeah. yeah. So is the, is the word joyride actually in the contract? We can't take it out for a joyride? It's no, pretty a much. Well, it's open for interpretation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Kill yeah, joy. Most Navy things are, right? I figure yeah. any kind of navigation, this thing is a joyride, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that makes no. sense to me. Here I yeah. thought we were striking projectiles down so that we could recreate the um the alien movie yeah. right. that was <laughs> over on yeah. the and trust me that you know we got a bunch enough. of old shipmates on board yeah. we're going to strike down some bullets and go you know shoot it yeah. yeah somebody can throw one of those real hard and they're gonna be real strong but the, so there, there's a couple of good reasons here one of them of course is this projectile thing you know we, right. we need to get them uh, up forward and so we're going to drop them down at our leisure you know i'm thinking two to four a week over the next year plus and, and that allows us to do things at a more reasonable pace, but we have to drag them all the way through Broadway, just like the movie, and get them up and drop them down next to medical, and they go down even further, and then they go through the, um, you know, magazine. the central flat, the magazine, and go back up into the turret. And there's a lot of systems involved with that, and there's a lot of safety requirements too, because you're dealing with one-ton projectiles. And it's an incredible investment of both time and some financial resources, because as you just said, two to four a week over the next months and years. I mean, that's going to be quite an effort on the team's behalf. But to do that, you have now a incredible display for guests to come down and enjoy. And then there's also the preservation aspect where it's lifting the stern just a bit as it ballasts. So I think that all of these upfront costs, whether it's power or some of the costs associated with the maintenance and uh, machinery to move all these pieces and put them into place in the long term, we're actually saving quite a bit uh, to, and saving quite a bit of Iowa's life if we're preserving some of those hull and um, preservation aspects. Yeah, without questioning, the, the advantages outweigh just you know the the fact we're going to put projectiles on display. The ship right now has 800 tons of, of freshwater ballast up forward, and we a lot of that was, or a portion of it was actually there from the Navy when they had it, um, and then we added another 300 tons up in Sassoon Bay just to bring her stern up so we could clear the bottom, the mud. Literally, we were dragging in the mud when we left um, back in 2012. So uh, what I'd like to do is, in addition to providing those display opportunities, which are absolutely appropriate and going to be very cool, uh, I'll also be able to offload some 170 tons of freshwater ballast up forward and maintain the trim of the vessel. So you know, once again, in addition to uh, you know, the, the practical purpose of, of getting projectiles up there, we have this added uh, deal with dealing with uh, the preservation of the ship. But then finally, and this is a big one for me, and I want David to, to comment on this too, to me, it's also partly about inspiration. I really believe yeah. that this ship is, is really about inspiration. It's not just about putting something on display and putting it in a box or whatever. It's not a model ship. This is a living ship. We are the fourth crew, 
And we need to be able to, you know, really present that. And it's a wonderful connection back to the, you know, my dad was on a battleship. You know, David was, of course, served aboard this. Uh, the people who designed this and ran it for, for so many years, it's a wonderful connection. And David, I think you had some thoughts on that, too. You know, it speaks very much to the ethos of, of the organization. And it's one thing I'm very proud to be involved here uh, as a Iowa veteran as well, is to see the ship continuing her life to inspire and teach and train others. And I think one of the approaches we want to, we, we've always wanted to take is to do as much restoration as you can, uh, not just to preserve the ship in its current state, but to actually do some restoration. Uh, you know, my, I'm kind of a car guy. My wife is actually more of a car person than I am. And uh, we've got a 65 Mustang in the garage and a 55 truck. So the 55 is mine. Her is in a garage. So that's significant. But we're working through the restoration of that vehicle. And you don't purchase one of these classic vehicles to leave it on display. And I don't think that we have the ship simply to display it in a state, as you said, like a model in a box. Uh, but rather to do the restoration so that um, she stays alive and her capabilities are able to be demonstrated and therefore inspire others. Yeah, it's amazing that the output is phenomenal, isn't it, Kyle? I mean, yeah. you, you commented on it too. Right. Well, I think looking back at the, the purpose of the launch of that Mustang back in 1964 and a half with the original Mustang, <laughs> it was to re-energize a, a population. It was it was to energize the the youth of America and say, this is a cool muscle car. We have this a similar capability of yeah. doing that here. It just looks a little bit different. And I think all of that, including what we've done aboard the last 10 years, is reflective of why we're the right team to take on the National Museum of the Surface Navy. There, It's extremely forward thinking. It's something that we're still grappling with to provide the, the right story and the right words and the right experience to people to really put on display both why the surface Navy is important, but why I was the right place to do it and why we are the right crew to put that museum experience on. And I think we're very fortunate to be able to do that. Yeah. It's the other uh, um, output or feedback rather it has been amazing. Uh, certainly the stuff on YouTube. I mean, former crew members are in tears. I mean, I can't tell you how many yeah. people texted me, sent me emails. I mean, it's been phenomenal. I had donors reach out to me, right. um, you know, Chris did and, and, and others, um, you know, saying, Hey, I'm inspired to come back this week because you guys do some cool stuff, you know, and, yeah. and that's, that's really the, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps now. It's amazing to see that kind of outpouring of, of energy. Uh, there's been a few people in the, in the museum industry that said, well, why, you know, and it wasn't too critical, but, but, you know, inspiration is a powerful thing and yeah. uh, being able to do that. And, and, and also once again, that connection for me personally, as it is for David is, is really right. neat. Right. And just because you've mentioned the word donation in there, I think there's a great opportunity here. There, It's really more than a donation. It, it really is an investment. Uh, everything we're doing with that project is investing in a long term, whether it's an experience or a preservation effort. And so if folks are interested in, in supporting everything we do in the operations and uh, preservation department, if you visit PacificBattleship.com slash donate, there's a drop down that goes directly to our preservation um, budget line item that is both maintaining the ship making sure that the experience that people have on board is fantastic and the ship is operating and floating still um, but it also is a bit of a rainy day fund for when unexpected in a way projects yeah. like this come up um, so when we see these opportunities that there's a, a long-term benefit if we put in some money from that budget now there's gonna be a great return so anything that people want to contribute to that preservation fund again pacificbattleship.com slash donate go to that little preservation and ops drop down. Um, it's really, I mean, for us, we have, have what a two to two and a half million dollar budget just to be a baseline on a, for the organization. So everything we do on top of that programmatically or capital campaign wise, um, we need to start there before we can do anything else. And so there's a, it's really crucial to everything we do as part of the organization. Yeah, I've been today writing something um, I'll probably end up sharing with more people than just, just uh, right now, uh, Admiral Shatinsky and, and Moran. But basically, the ship is so much more than just a museum. You know, it's, yes, very it's much. this profoundly important community um, component down here, whether it's the veterans programs or, you know, 600 people receive our emails every weekend. And, and uh, are, they're, they're actively engaged in life down here. They're affecting other people's lives. There's so much that's going on down here with other nonprofits. It's just phenomenal. It's not just a still life museum ship sitting here and that that's what's cool about this place no and it you know just to jump back on the on the ethos comment 
you know, one of the things that technology team is doing right now, and they've been working on for a number of years, it's been in the background is restoring the telephone system. It doesn't sound like much, uh, but the ship has about, well, it has over 1800 telephones on it. Um, and, uh, you know, every space on there has a telephone and it would be so easy to go in there and just drop, a, a office PBX and put dial tone on those and make them ring. And that would be cool. Uh, but instead we're partnering with a, a museum up in Seattle, a telecommunications museum, and we're literally rebuilding the 1980s telephone switch that was on there. And we want to bring that on online. Because it again, it speaks to the ethos. There is there is a necessity to have telephones in the spaces of the ship, and that's great. But there's also a desire to restore it the way she was functioning at our preservation date in the 1990s. Yeah, I yeah. love that. We had today, the last two days actually, we have had LA County Fire uh, Search and Rescue on board helping the radio team restore. I, Gary Lopes, forgive me if I get this wrong. The HF fan antenna. Is that? Oh, well done. Well ah. done. It is the HF fan antenna. In fact, and, <laughs> wow. uh, and, Look at you. Uh, it's kind of neat. We have one, uh, one volunteer who had been working on that and his health has been declining and uh, didn't think he'd be able to see it. And his wife was able to bring him out and watch the people climb and actually uh, put up what was a number of, of uh, years of hard work on his behalf uh, yeah. to actually get the, the drawings and remanufactured the antenna and uh, source the correct couplers for it. You know, and it's, it's kind of neat to not just throw something up that quote unquote looks right, but to actually restore something to working condition. Yeah. And they're talking about within the next couple of months, they're actually going to be on the air with it, which is wow. super cool. Yeah. That's super, yeah. Anyways, uh, we're not going to, um, I, I don't think we're going to, you know, start selling rides on turrets anytime <laughs> soon, but, um, you know, it is 80 year old machinery, but it's very, very cool to have it operable. There's been a lot right. of questions about other, you know, next steps. Certainly right now we're just trying to change all the, or, or verify all the safety stuff. You know, right. it really is critical. I'm not about to drop a shell on somebody's foot, especially yeah. the people I care about. So, um, that's kind of it you yeah. know, on that. No, well, it's, I mean, we're doing things like this and evolving Iowa's story and her story is continuing to take her own path. And, and day after day, we're doing everything we can to keep her alive and, and keep that story going. Right. Concurrently, there's a new Iowa yeah. out there in the, in the waters. So some of the team members had the chance to go out there. David, what was your experience like with the new submarine? I, I kind of, I, I wish it was a new Iowa in the waters. It's actually a new Iowa still in the assembly building because the elevator to put it in Maybe the water, by now was, it's in the water. Uh, was yeah. broken. <laughs> but um, no, I was able to go out and accompany Jonathan uh, out to electric boat and see the christening of the new USS Iowa. That's SSN 797 and able to talk to the new command triad out there and some members of the crew which for me, when I joined the crew of the battleship Iowa, talking to some of the World War II vets was super important to me because I felt like I was standing in the footprints of giants. Mm -hmm. And it was very odd to be treated the same way by this very young crew who is going aboard the, wow. the submarine. It made me feel both really honored and also very old. <laughs> but um, no, it was, it was a really neat opportunity to go out there. You know, I often joke about the Navy being 250 years of tradition unhampered by progress. Uh, and the christening of a vessel goes back a long, long time. Uh, but it was uh, it was super neat to see that. That's actually mechanically where the where the builders, where the shipyard is is turning over the vessel to the navy. Uh, and so the navy crew now will take a much more active ro role in the rest of her fitting out and in her testing. And super soon, hopefully, she will actually be in the water, and then she'll start sea trials, and then. That period culminates with the actual commissioning ceremony where she stops being the PCU Iowa or the Prospective Commissioning Unit Iowa and becomes USS or United States Ship Iowa. That's cool. By the way, um, uh, Tim, my son, who is a lieutenant on a boomer, just returned to port this morning, David. Nice. Yeah, so he's back from his, uh, actually his first full deployment on a boomer. Uh, nice. He's a submarine kid now. Yeah. They're all crazy. Yeah. I, I <laughs> might do it. My number four wants to serve on submarines. And uh, I won't repeat what my father said to me when I told him I wanted to be on submarines, but it resulted in me serving on surface ships. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I had no say in the matter. So well, mm-hmm. it's cool that we're involved in in a process like that because I mean, with with no offense or taking away from anything that's been accomplished here, they invited a couple battleship guys, battleship museum guys, to come out and be a part of this yeah. this christening. Yeah. It, it shows that there's a magnitude behind what we're doing and people recognize our team for it. So that's kind of cool to be, be involved in something like that. It is. Yeah. Very yeah. Much. yeah. Yeah. I really do consider this the fourth crew of the, of the right. ship. I mean, it's, it's, it's different, but it's, it's really special. In fact, what's really amazingly special for me, David, I know you, you probably get this very much, but um, you know, a lot of the I- Iowa veterans association, as we call it, the IVA um, they're they've been out here what was it three weeks ago they left, I yeah. think. They were for yeah. the, here for their annual reunion. And and so many of them literally call us shipmates. Literally call us shipmates. I mean yeah, and that's, it's that's very, very emotional, meaningful. very important to them yeah. because we are working on their vessel. Yeah, it's really pretty neat. Or more accurately, our vessel, and I yeah. can speak as right. both a member of the third crew and a member of the fourth crew. It is our vessel and it's good to welcome shipmates home. Uh it's also good to see them every single day when I go aboard to go to work. Yeah. Yeah, Very exactly. Cool. I love saying that too. I never tell them, you know, welcome aboard. I always say welcome back or welcome home. Yeah. Yeah. It's the home aspect that's really important. And it's our home here too. Yeah. It's so much more than that. And it it, sadly, even in some of these podcasts and I have a few specific ones in mind and some of the museum circles, you know, it's not quite viewed that way. And once again, it's that still life. Um, This is much more um, active, um, much more living, dynamic, I think, uh, than, than you would have ever thought. Yeah. It's, right. it's fun, too, because you get both sides of it. You get to see pretty much exactly what it was like, but you also get to experience it as more of a living thing. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. The, the one moment I had, David, uh, just some weeks ago, just a week or a few days before we cranked up the turret was there was so much activity and the blowers were on in the turret, I suddenly felt like I was on a living vessel again. You know, it really hits you. If you're a a sailor, and I have a merchant marine background, you know, the, the, the noise of the vessel, the, the sounds, the feel of the vessel, the vibration, everything else, it, it makes it feel alive. And that, that's what was cool this week. Yeah. It's, it, I, I mean, my friends ask me what it's like working here and what I do each day. And I generally tell them no two days are alike. Yeah, pretty and much. And that's because I think that in the, the work side of things, all the people we work with, all the tasks that need to be done, they kind of evolve and have a living side to them. But when you come to your place of work, which has its own life to it, it kind of adds another element of change. And so you never really know what's to be expected in every coming day. And that's what keeps it so exciting and evolving. And there, are, there's no day that you don't arrive here expecting something normal, which is very cool. <laughs> yeah. What do you always say, Moran? Still, <laughs> still waiting. waiting for that dull day on Battleship Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, normal, normal is overrated. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we don't do normal very well. Right. Yeah, it's pretty. Well, we had an amazing week between the oil issues out in the parking lot had nothing to do with us. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, of course, the turret. We had a couple of other issues. It was an exciting week and a half. Well, before that, too, with all the the Iowa veterans aboard, like we got to sit down for over an hour with the chief engineer who recommissioned the ship in the 80s. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. Bill Ernest. Yeah. Phenomenal connection. It was just a really, really cool to have that moment. Yeah. And we'll get that out to you guys when we get a chance, because just wow. Yeah, yeah. What Too a life, cool. not just Iowa, but what a life in general. Yeah, he was, the, he was the real deal, so. And speaking of that, keep an eye on our YouTube channel because we are still sorting through. We had, what, we had about 11 cameras plus me roaming with my cell phone when we turned the turret, so we've got all kinds of footage and all kinds of stuff that will be coming as soon as our very small but dedicated team can get it moving. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty exciting, and there's there's footage in there that that probably hasn't ever been seen in any other format too. So right. pretty neat stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, we encourage your support of our neat stuff. Again, PacificBattleship.com/slash/donate, or if you'd like to stay involved with where we're going tomorrow with the National Museum of the Surface Navy, SurfaceNavyMuseum.org. Sign up to be a plank owner. You can sign up and donate there. Everything we're doing here is supporting where we're going tomorrow and help t- telling Iowa's story in, in our own way and in her way as well, extending those legacies. So um, cool. that's all I've got for us today. All right, David, you want to wrap us up? All right, I guess that's, uh, that's my cue. Thank you for joining us on another exciting episode of Scuttlebutt, the official podcast of the National Museum of the Surface Navy in association with 
the Surface Navy Association Battleship <laughs> Iowa chapter. There well, you go. So I got that all out. We'll throw some more words uh, in there I hope you'll join time. us next time. If you guys have comments, questions, um, rude gestures don't usually come through the uh, through the email, but if you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please send them to podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T at labattleship.com or podcast at labattleship.com. And until mm-hmm, next French. time. Stay cool. That's it. That's your cue. <laughs> Be cool and have a great summer. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I have a different sing. phrase. I'll say that. <laughs> we're going to leave that one there. All right. Iowa out. There you go.